Before I finish our lectures on neural networks, I need to give you some warnings about their use in computer vision because they don't see things the same way that humans see them. Right? They're very, very different. Um, and in particular, confounding can be quite bad in, in neural networks for computer vision. Um, I'm going to give you a story. I'm not sure if this story is true, but it's definitely been hanging around for a while. So it's kind of, and it's kind of interesting and, and gives you the point. Anyway, so the rumor is that the U.S. military designs a neural network to predict, uh, to, to detect tanks and images. And their method works beautifully. It works perfectly, even out of sample on the data set that they've constructed, right? They paid a lot of money to, to have people go and take pictures of tanks in all different settings and, you know, really wide variety of different settings. Um, and then they take pictures without tanks and then the network tried to tell the difference. Anyway, so perfect accuracy. Then they go bring it out into the field and it doesn't work at all. So what happened? Well, the story goes that uh, they went back and investigated and figured out that all the, all the pictures of tanks in the data set were taken during the day and all the other pictures were taken at night. So all they did was build the detector for daylight. Um, anyway, so you could say, fine, well, that's, that's, <laughs> that was a bad data set. But the problem is that confounding occurs in many, many data sets. Sometimes there's no way to get rid of it. And sometimes there's no way to detect whether it's even there. Uh, and medical data sets are kind of a prime example for this. Um, this paper, for instance, was talking about detecting, um, the, the, they were trying to predict bad medical outcomes from x-rays. Now, uh, the problem that they ran into was that they figured out that, um, that some of the images were taken on portable x-rays and some of them were taken on regular x-rays. And so the neural network was detecting the presence of the word portable in the image. Okay, so why would it do that? Well, it turned out the people who were getting portable x-rays were people who couldn't make it to the regular x-ray machine because they had medical problems. Um, so the, the occurrence of the word portable in the image was a very good predictor of, of bad medical outcomes. And unfortunately, the network ignored all the actual medical content in the image, which was not what the designers of the network actually intended. And so, you know, what is the solution to this? If you actually wanted to look at the medical content of the image, what do you do? Um, well, I don't know the answer. Um, and in fact, uh, we're struggling in our own work with dealing with medical images and interpretable neural networks. Um, we're trying to add interpretability so that at least if the network is not looking in the right place or it's not, um, it's not um, understanding uh, what what compare what correct comparison it's making to past images. We can at least know about it. Um, another way you can deal with this is heavy testing, right? Try to test the the thing in as many instances. You know, try to break it and, and make sure it doesn't break. And then another way um, to deal with this is massive data augmentation. But uh, even if you do that data augmentation, you don't know whether you're actually making the problem worse or you're solving the issue. Uh, but in any case. Um, this is a, a major problem that you need to know about when dealing with neural networks, especially if you don't have a massive data set. Okay, deep fakes. Um, you all know that they're, they're dangerous. Um, I've just shown a clip here of the University of Washington work where they were able to get Obama to say whatever they wanted him to say um, very realistically. And then uh, I just put an article below about the fact that the deep fakes is an arms race, okay? So it's an arms race between people generating deep fakes and people detecting deep fakes. Now, unfortunately with this arms race, um, the better, because, because, of, because of GANs, which I'll tell you about shortly, um, the better detector you build, actually that, in, that enables a better generator to be built. So the only way this arms race will end is when these generators are so realistic that they really actually cannot uh, determine that that you really can that no detector can determine the difference between true and fake. Okay, so let me um, let me just explain how that works. Oh, oh, by the way, um, here's an article here where uh, a voice deep fake was used to scam a CEO out of some money. You know the the. <laughs> they call up the CEO, hey, blah, do blah, blah, blah. And the CEO says, oh, oh, yeah, you. Okay, yeah, that's, that's you. That's who I think it is, but it wasn't. All right, so GANs, um, they're actor critic models. Um, so actor critic models have been around for a long time. GANs are actually very successful in the sense of being actor critic models. So it's a, there's an actor and a critic, and the, the actor tries to do the best job they can. The critic says, no, you're not doing well enough. The actor improves. So 
Anyway, so GANs produce very realistic looking images or data. They can be used for scientific data to create data sets, larger and larger data sets. Um, and if they're realistic, then um, you can use your algorithms for scientific discovery to, to sort of test those out on this fake data. Um, GANs are used very commonly for AI artwork and for deep fakes. Okay, the, uh, the actor and the critic are a generator network and a discriminator network. So these are two neural networks. They're working against each other. Um, the generator is trying to generate images. And the idea is that if you put random numbers in, the generator generates realistic looking random images. And then um, on the other hand, the real world is generating images and then the discriminator network's job is to tell them apart. Now, if the uh, generator generates images that the discriminator cannot tell apart from real images, then that means the generator is good. And so the arms race I was referring to in the last slide is between the generators and the discriminators. But of course, um, if you build a better discriminator, it only helps, it, it only serves as a better critic for the generator network and it only helps the generator network to get better. So the better discriminators we build, the better generators we build. Um, so I'm just putting up the game theoretic um, uh, formulation for GANs. And uh, it's a, these two, act, these two um, networks, the discriminator and the generator, they play the following um, two-player minimax game with value function V. So it's, it's min over G, max over D of V. Okay, so what is V? Um, there are two terms. The first one is the discriminator, is the, just involves the discriminator, who's trying to maximize the likelihood of the real data. Now the discriminator is also trying to um, minimize the likelihood of the generated data. Okay, so it's trying to maximize the likelihood of real data, minimize the likelihood of the generated data. And the generator's job, the generator again is G, which is inside there, generating that fake data that's being fed to the discriminator. The generator is trying to maximize the likelihood of the generated data. So they're working against each other here. And um, yeah, so the generator aims to make the discriminator not work well. Now, the way these things are trained um, is very, very difficult to train again. Okay, if you, th if you thought a regular neural network was hard to train, a GAN is really, really hard to train. Um, what, people have, what people generally try to do is they uh, do gradient ascent steps on the discriminator, because you're trying to maximize with respect to D, and then gradient descent steps on the generator. Um, but there are a number of tricks that people have used to try to train them more easily. So for instance, um, apparently the one minus inside that log is actually make, it actually makes it difficult to train. So what people um, often do is they get rid of the one minus, and then instead of, instead of uh, that term being minimized by the generator, they, max, they have the generator maximize that term. So it's log of D, and then you maximize it. And then, uh, then they're both doing gradient ascent. Um, and that apparently makes it a little easier to train. Now, GANs are really great for artwork. Um, I just put this up because I thought it was so funny. This piece of artwork, this is generated by a GAN, and you can see the little equation there uh, uh, at the bottom, and that sold for $432,000 at Christie's, which I thought was just, oh my gosh, so funny. You could print this picture out, <laughs> and that's what they're selling it for. Anyway, so GANs, um, they do a beautiful job of transferring style from one image to the next. Uh, this is a photo um, over here, over on the left, is a photo, and then it, the style from different paintings is being transferred to that photo, and you can see how lovely those pictures look. So I'm just putting up here uh, a, um, um, just some work that was done at Duke on the Pulse algorithm. So Pulse uses StyleGAN. StyleGAN is a pre-trained GAN. It was trained by NVIDIA. And um, StyleGAN is arguably the best GAN in existence um, in terms of the realism of the photos that it generates. So it, it's a it's GAN for faces. Um, and you put in a random vector and it generates a face. And what Pulse does is it searches through the latent space of that GAN to try to find um, faces that downscale to a particular input image. So of the three images that I'm showing here uh, next to me, the only image that is actually of a real person is the one in the lower left, which says input next to it. It's a very grainy, blurry image. And then the GAN generated all of those images that I showed you just a second ago. 
Um, so all of the all of the images here, these are all fake people. None of them are real, but they all downsample um, pretty much perfectly to um, to the input image. Okay. So what what it's showing you? Oh, and by the way, this is a um, people had a lot of fun with this algorithm. They started they put in um, the video game characters into this algorithm, and it produced realistic looking people that downsampled down, down properly to um, the uh, the video game characters. So that was kind of fun. But in any case, um, Pulse uh, this algorithm is called Pulse. It shows us that there's often no hope of identifying someone in a grainy security video because there are many many high-res images that correspond perfectly to one low-res image. So there's actually a loss of information in those security uh, videos to the point where you can't enhance the video to, to re-identify the person. Okay, so it's actually proving, proving that empirically. Okay, another issue with neural networks is they can be very brittle. Um, there's a lot of work on adver adversarial attacks on neural networks. They show that changing a single pixel in an image can change the predicted class in modern machine learning systems. Because again, real, the, real, the manifold of real images is, is a very narrow manifold in high dimensional pixel space. And so if you change one pixel, you go off the manifold of realistic looking images and then you're out somewhere into a space where there's no data. And so that could intersect a neural network's decision boundary. Um, and uh, obviously networks are, they're, hopefully they're trained to sort of um, be robust to these adversarial attacks, but it's actually fairly easy to, to fool a computer vision system if it's not trained in a very robust way. Uh, so there's been examples where people placed stickers on stop signs to try to coerce a computer vision system to recognize it as a speed limit sign, which could be very dangerous for a self-driving car to miss that um, stop sign. So to deal with this, uh, we really we really need to find ways to make our neural networks robust to to, um, to these types of attacks. Um, also, when you design a, a computer vision system, um, that model will not always be used in the way that you intended it to. So for instance, uh, recently, just a couple months ago, someone was arrested because of in incorrect facial recognition. So facial recognition systems are not perfect. And they're, they're particularly, as I mentioned, not perfect for um, people of certain races, for instance, people who are black. Um, and then you, the, the thing is that when, when, you're look, when you're using a computer vision system, you can't expect that it will have perfect identification. And so the way you act based on what the information it's giving you is important. So in this case, um, the police officers who looked at this facial recognition should have actually evaluated themselves whether the facial match was actually accurate. And in this case, it was obvious that it wasn't accurate. Um, and so uh, you, you have to realize that if something is not 100% accurate, you can't act, you should not act on it alone without a human intervening. Um, so you have to be careful when you design a system that people won't assume that it's 100% accurate and that they'll, they'll double check it when they use it. So uh, my point is that much care is needed in applications of neural networks, particularly for computer vision. And I've given some examples in medical image processing where you have confounding automated driving systems where they're not robust and not perfect. And so we have to be very careful in the way we train them if we want to trust them. Uh, facial recognition systems, again, which are not perfect and we have to watch out for racial bias. And also um, deep fakes, which are easily fraudulent and can cause serious problems for society, especially when people don't really care whether whether um, w what the truth actually is. But neural on the other hand, neural networks are really great for artwork. Thanks.